All right, it is time for us to get started here. We're on lesson 62. We're going to uh, finish up Genesis 45 and also go through all of chapter 46. There's a fair amount uh, in, especially in chapter 46, that we won't uh, take the time to read in, in, in great detail, verse by verse. Uh, but there's a lot for us to get still out of this lesson. I think this is one where there, there's a lesson for us to take, not just in, in, in trying to learn about uh, God's people and promises that he's given, but lessons that sort of pearls of wisdom, I guess you could say, that uh, that should stick with us today and teach us how to uh, how to behave in a way that not only pleases God, but gets us through life in, in one piece as possible. Uh, before we get started, Tim is going to lead us in open prayer. Pray. Our Holy Father and our God, we come before you on this Wednesday evening, thankful for this opportunity, Father, we have to open your word. We pray, Father, you'll help us to have uh, open minds and hearts and to digest what we're discussing tonight, to be participatory, and we pray, Father, you'll help us to um, continue to focus on heaven. We pray, Father, for those of our number who aren't able to be with us this evening, whether it be sickness or, or travel, we just pray, Father, that they'll be able to come back uh, the next time that uh, is possible. We pray for uh, Devin Dasher at this time, a uh, family member of our, of, uh, our congregation uh, members, and we pray, Father, that the doctors attending to him and the treatments they'll be giving him will be uh, beneficial to him, that he'll be able to uh, overcome this cancer. We pray, Father, uh, we put everything in your hands. Help us to pray for each other, Father, when we have the opportunity. Help us to let each other know when we need prayers and uh, not pull back, Father, and just keep those things to ourselves. Let us uh, share as we should with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ that we let each other know our, our shortcomings and our successes, that we may um, reap the joy, Father, that we have uh, here on this earth, but help us, Father, to focus on heaven and the joy that awaits us there, Father, if we've been found faithful. So we pray, Father, you'll help us to stay on the straight and narrow path and to not deviate. We just thank you so much for Jesus and his sacrifice for us and his love for us that he died and um, was resurrected, Father, now with you. We thank you so much now for this opportunity we have to study your word. In the name of your son, we pray. Amen. So, to get started, who would like to recite our current memory verse? Is that a hand, Nancy? Yes. It's Genesis 46. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand, Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. That's right. There was a, I was having to look at it. And, huh, that's not quite the exact wording that I remembered. And it's partly because I've been looking at it in uh, different versions, and partly because it's just so hard to get the exact wording. There's a couple of little uh, things that, that don't really matter a whole lot to the exact meaning, but. Uh, uh, it's still it's still worthwhile trying to figure out and trying to, to memorize it exactly. Okay, so that verse, of course, appears in our text for this week. But first, in order to, to know where we're going, we should look at where we have been. So what did we cover on Sunday? On Sunday, Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. His brothers came back. Um, brought Benjamin with them and basically uh, let them know who he was and um, they kind of figured out that something was going on. We're sitting in the order of our birth and we know that. <laughs> uh, but um, so now now uh, we, we, get to, we get to see what happens now when they get to go back and tell dad, hey, He's just he's alive. So about that time, <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the funny things about this text here. Uh, that's it. That's sort of the burning question, you know. Yeah. Especially as, especially if, if you if you have your own kids and you're thinking about perhaps times that they pull one over on you and you discover it later, or times certainly that they try to pull it over on you. I know we've all got those, and you you found them out immediately. Um, I'm really curious about that, but it just doesn't really come up. They go back and they report to dad and. The story just moves on from there, and they don't really handle any of that baggage from 22 years prior. But, uh, be that as it may, there's still plenty for us to learn from it. Let's see. Uh, I think 
from Sunday, I want to say we would probably be about up to Dan. So Dan, do you want to read verses 16 through 20 of chapter 45, please? When the news was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this, load your beasts and go to the land of Canaan, and take your father and your household and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and will eat the fat of the land. Then your order, Do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt, for your little ones and for your wives, bring your father and come. Do not concern yourselves with your goods, for the best of the land of Egypt is yours. All right, thank you. Question number one, how did Pharaoh react to the news that Joseph's brothers had come to Egypt? It pleased him. Sorry? It pleased him. Okay, yeah, he was quite happy about this. Now, how did he learn of this in the first place? Nancy? Well, it was overheard that, you know, Joseph was... And his brothers had come. And of course, they told Pharaoh, and Pharaoh had Joseph, you know, had, had come to him to say that he does have his family. Okay, so if you remember back to, to last, or I guess it was to Sunday, um, Joseph is trying to keep this concealed, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Back in uh, the beginning of chapter 45, uh, he says in verse 1, Make everyone go out from me, so no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. So it's as if he's trying to keep this knowledge just between himself and his brothers here, who are here in this room. And then in verse 2, And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. So it's like he's sort of trying to keep it under wraps, but it doesn't, it doesn't work out very well. Um, they, Pharaoh learns of it anyway. Now, why, why is Pharaoh so pleased about uh, Joseph's brothers? Why should he care? Well, for one, you can tell how, how happy that Joseph is that um, his family is there, not, whether he knows you know, all the circumstances you know, kind of thing or not. But, um, and he knows what kind of person that Joseph is. And if he has brothers, you would think that you know, bring all of your family because they're probably really good people too. So one of the things we assume about, you know, people that we meet, we meet one person and, you know, we can't wait to meet the rest of them and those kind of things. It's like, you know, they're going to be um, similar to you. Okay, so based on the, the interaction and the relationship that Pharaoh already has with Joseph, it seems like this can only be a good thing, right? And how did Joseph himself characterize that relationship that he has with Pharaoh? It's not in our text from tonight, but from Sunday. Remember that? Like, and, oh, sorry? Oh, go ahead. Uh, like Nancy, father, yeah. That he was father to Pharaoh. Yeah, that's right. It said in verse 8 of chapter 45, uh, da, 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 he has been talking about God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house, and etc. So um, you know, we talked some about that relationship on Sunday as well. Uh, obviously, as a result of that, Pharaoh is quite pleased because this is something, as Tim said, that's, well, if Joseph is excited about it, then that's reason enough for me to be excited about it because he thinks so highly of Joseph, and Joseph's not so much for it. Okay, now how adamant is Pharaoh about uh, having Jacob and, and family move down to Egypt? And is it just like a sort of a, well, hey, you know, here's, here's an idea, just a thought, but you know, do with it what you will. What's, uh, what's the deal? In verse 19, he said, now you're ordered. <laughs> That's right. Do this. Take these things. Go. And who, whom is he ordering there? <laughs> Pharaoh's ordering them. Ordering whom? Joseph. His yeah. brothers. Sorry? His brothers. Uh, but there's Joseph. a, a middleman. Joseph. He's ordering Joseph because to order his brothers to order their father, right? So think about that for a second. Uh, it's kind of hard to put all those dots together, but Pharaoh is ordering Joseph to have this thing done. How many orders have we seen Pharaoh give Joseph? Well, because he trusts Joseph to do anything he wants to do, so he just lets him, he trusts everything he does. Yeah, that's basically the only order that we've seen him give has been, oh, okay, well, you deal with this as you see fit. He trusts Joseph completely with, with everything, but here he just 
directs Joseph, hey, hey I, you're going to do this. So he, he is very uh, adamant that this should happen. Nancy? But he also told Joseph that he would be second to Pharaoh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't going to be, he had no power over Pharaoh. So sure, yeah. He's he certainly not letting Joseph take his place. Uh, he's not He's not relinquishing the, right. uh, the authority to tell Joseph what to do. We just don't see him exercising that authority uh, very much at all. But here is an example of them doing so and it's not and it's not in a, in a in a question that matters a whole lot to pharaoh because it's his pet project or anything like that it's about joseph's family and yet pharaoh uh, very very much wants for israel for for, for um, joseph's family to move down to egypt number two what mode of transportation did pharaoh provide for the relocation of joseph's family wagons Wagons, right? Okay, so uh, he provides all these wagons, which seems like no big deal, but uh, I mean, it is kind of a big deal. They're just pretty expensive. Go ahead, Tim. Well, it seems like he's almost just writing a blank check. I don't know how big your family is, but whatever it takes, whatever you need, takes enough that you can get them here and without any... Pretty much, and we read about all this uh, all this provision and, and whatnot, and I think I might be getting a little bit ahead of myself here, so I'll, I'll zip my mouth. Um, in verse 20... Let's reread that real quick. Verse 20, uh, we find it, Have no concern for your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. What, what is Pharaoh suggesting there? Dan? They're going to be made men. Right? They're, they're going to not just be welcome to stay here, but they're going to be provided for very materially. Okay, so it's, it's not a situation of, uh, well, hey, they would be really good for us. So let's let's have them come because that'll I mean it'll add to the tax base and all that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah I mean, and not to totally divert from the direction you're you're going, right? But you know, if you think all the way back to when Joseph interprets the dream, right, he gives an accreditation to God for that. And when he's talking about his brothers here, um, <clears throat> verse uh, seven, right? Talk. He's talking again. He's, Joseph is very aggressive and very forward in giving. Uh, credit to God that you know he was this was his plan and this was like the remnant <coughs> and so on and so forth. So in reading this, I've you know wondered in the past is Joseph is uh, Pharaoh seeing this as you know God was with this one guy and now I've got his brothers and his father too. Like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna reap tenfold of whatever I give them something like that. That very well could be the case. Julius also thinks that was funny. Huh? Yeah. Uh, that very well could be the case, and you know it's such a. When we when we think about all of that and all that's, that's transpired here between Joseph and Pharaoh and now Joseph's family, um, and then we get into the first chapter of Exodus and you know a new king arose who did not know Joseph. Just what a stark <coughs> change that is, Janet. Well, and it also could be that because Joseph's basically saved the country, yeah. the, everything. It's a gesture of destruction, and that this is you know I'm going to give you this. You know, blessing and he calls it whatever it is. I'm going to give you this because you know you've saved us. It's the least I can do. Right, uh, Missy. I think your hand went up. Yeah, I mean, just a couple of verses before that. You know, he says, that "I will give you the best of the land, and you will eat of the fat of it." I mean, it's just another way of saying that. You know, Joseph already has. If you might, if you say some of the best stuff that's there in the fat of it, this is obviously his family's going to get that as well. Yeah. So it's not even like you know, from what from within what Joseph has. You guys are going to be well taken care of. Pharaoh's making it clear, I'm going to take care of you too. Tim? And just think about a move. I think all of it, the work part of moving is the packing up. There's not the unpacking or those kind of things. And if someone said, you don't even have to pack up your stuff. Whatever stuff you have, maybe sentimental stuff, but the rest of it, leave it behind, give it to somebody else. We'll cover you on this. Yeah, thing. and that's, that's really where I wanted to get here because that suggestion, especially... In a society like this, where your wealth is tied up not in you know bank accounts or stocks or anything like that, it's in the literal uh, physical items that are right there with you: your livestock, your herds, your uh, your own wagons. For crying out loud, your your physical property, and yet the idea of picking up all that stuff and putting it in a wagon and taking it all the way to Egypt is kind of Oh boy, this is, I've moved a lot. Uh, I'm sure many of you have too. I've moved a lot. I moved not long ago and I didn't want to for so many reasons. This was one of them. And I, all I had to do was go across town and it was miserable. 
And here they are. They're going to take they're going to take these, uh, these 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 trailer loads not just across town but all the way down to Egypt. Uh, that sounds like no fun. And he's saying, "Don't worry about it. If it's easier, leave stuff at, leave stuff back in Canaan, and you'll you'll get new stuff. Don't worry about it." Now, uh, sort of a, a minor point here, but we find out in chapter forty six that it doesn't sound like Jacob and family really take him up completely on that because it does say that they they took their stuff with them, but. Uh, at least the suggestion was there. Don't hesitate to leave your stuff if you want. Um, now, we spent a little bit of time on that point, and there's a reason I wanted to, to cover it so thoroughly. Is there a lesson in that for us today? I just take Pharaoh on faith. Just, I mean, to some degree. Okay, yeah, that's not where I was going, but that's a good lesson. Okay, so they have to... Uh, well, they have to decide: are they going to <laughs> are they going to trust him or not? Because if they decide, well, we're going to leave all of our stuff here, and then they get down to Egypt, and Pharaoh says, "Oh, you thought I was serious? Uh, well, <laughs> you're not going to get along very well here, then, are you?" Well, that that would have not been very good for them. So they do have there's some measure of trust that they have to show in the promise that's been given. What else can we take from it? <clears throat> How hard, how, put yourself in Jacob's position, or I don't know, Reuben's or Levi's or whoever's position here, with Pharaoh telling you, I've got better stuff waiting for you across the horizon. So don't, don't worry about what you have. Well, how do you feel about the things that you have? Tim? Well, yeah, I was going to, obviously, don't worry about the things on this earth, things about eternal things. Don't get so caught up in these things that you can't see what's ahead of you in the future. That's right. We spend, we put a lot of emphasis and value in our things. And that can be okay depending on why we're doing it and how we're doing it and to what purpose we're doing it. But if we're tying up our life in our possessions, I mean, that's like the opposite of what Jesus tells us to do, right? Don't lay up your treasures on earth where, you know, moth and, and rust destroy and all that sort of thing and thieves come in and steal. Lay up your treasures in heaven. Those things are eternal. The promise there is it's the same thing as the promise that Pharaoh is giving to, to Jacob and his family, isn't it? But don't worry about your stuff. I've got better stuff waiting for you here. And even if you've lived for decades and you have some stuff that you really like, and you go, I, I don't want to leave that thing here. Maybe it would be better to just stay up here in Canaan, right? <laughs> Not if you're going to starve to death. What good is it if you starve to death, but you have your thing? Leave the thing, go where the, the where, where the promises are, and as Dan pointed out, you have to trust that those promises are going to be fulfilled. Nancy and then Misty. And we can't we can't always take everything with us. We can't anyway. yeah, take anything with us, can we? And and it's just one of the things to realize and to know that that's why you can let it go because it's always going to be here as long as the earth is here. And that's even more stark for us than, uh, than it was for, for Jacob, right? At least he could. Whatever you can fit in these wagons, you can bring it with you. For us, it's, you know, naked I entered, or naked I came from my mother's womb, and, and naked I shall uh, return. Uh, Misty? In some ways, it's almost reminiscent of when God told Abraham to leave her. You know, in, in this case, some of the, the sons had been down to Egypt, but their families and Jacob had you know, really not, not in this way. And so if they have everything in mood, there's an element of trust in God as well that has to come into play. You know, because Jacob's saying, hey, you've got another five years of famine, but you're not going to just pack up, okay, well, five years of one day, it's time to go home. I mean, you're you're coming down here for the long haul. Right, right. And we're going to, uh, so Misty's kind of introducing a point that we're going to come to, especially when we get into chapter 46 in just a couple of minutes here. Question number three, uh, we're going to skip over reading verses 21 through 24. They're just, I'm guessing, I'm assuming that you've read them already. I hope you have. Uh, number three, how much provision was given to Benjamin? 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garment. Okay, and how does that uh, compare to what was given to the other brothers? They were given a change of clothes. Yeah, one change. Yeah, they were given a change of clothes, which, hey, nice, a change of clothes. And that means more to them in that culture than in ours, where it's like most, I don't know, most, a lot of people uh, shop for an entirely new wardrobe like once or twice a year. Um, that's, that's not such a thing for them. Okay, so he gave something of value to all the brothers, 
but uh, five changes of clothes to Benjamin and 300 pieces of silver, that's quite a bit. Of course, he also gives provision for all of them for the journey and, and all that sort of thing, as well as supplying the wagons for the trip back. Um, what did Joseph send back up with his brothers for their dad? Ten donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread before his father on the trip. So, if it wasn't enough to say Pharaoh down there is going to take care of everything, it's like, oh, by the way, here's a sample of some of the things you'll have at your disposal when you get there. Okay, so that's that's like that's half of it, right? Here's a sample. Here's your. <coughs> The term that's coming into my mind is earnest money, but that's not quite exactly the same thing. It's like a, it's a way of um, the first fruits, right? There's some sort of surety that the promises that I've made, I can keep, okay? So there's that, but also let's think back. He gives it, he sends this giant gift back to Jacob. Now, what, what had Jacob sent to Joseph? On this same trip, when his, when, his son, when his sons came down to see Joseph again, his brother. What? His brother. Uh, well, okay. yeah, that, that's what Joseph <laughs> cared about. But Jacob didn't realize it that, or at, at the time. So what? What was Jacob so focused on sending down along with the with the, all the brothers? Misty? Some gifts of the land of Canaan. That's right. So it's it's almost like this sort of gift exchange thing is going on right here. Now, uh, what? You find what verse was that in verse? Yeah, I didn't write it down. That was foolish. Okay, verse twenty-two. Uh, Ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt. Okay, that sounds like a lot of good things. Now, back in chapter uh, forty-five, I guess it would have been. Nope, back in chapter forty-four. Nope. <laughs> 40. Uh, at some point, I mean, okay, I'm not going to make you uh, watch me try to find that. But you remember when uh, Jacob sends down this gift of some of the, you know, the, the balm and the honey and, and all that sort of thing for Joseph. It's the same thing, the good things of the land, as, as much as we can afford, given that there's a famine going right now. So he sends this gift down to Joseph. Now, how do you think that this, the gift that Joseph sends back up to Jacob compares? It probably be equal to it would be comparable because it's the best goods of each country. Okay, yeah, that's a good so, way to look at it. So, Jake, Jacob sent the best because it says what he sent in um, 4311. It says that he sent um, balm and honey, aromatic gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, almonds, things like that were... They were not as common as they are sort of, now. Sort of delicacies, yes, right? Yes, yes. Whereas, I mean, now it's kind of like an everyday staple, except for some of the things like myrrh. You don't grow pistachios something. in your backyard, but you can go buy them. Usually. Right, yeah, yeah. So a lot of those things, then the, probably the same thing that Joseph sent from Egypt, things that normally you wouldn't get in Canaan. So he's, he's showing him things that if you come... You will be rewarded, and you will have things that you won't go without. Okay, so once again, we've got this, and, and I like the way that Denise put it there. Uh, obviously, the gift that, that Joseph sends back to Jacob is vastly superior in real terms. But in sort of spiritual terms, they're both giving their best, aren't they? They're both giving the best that they can to each other, and that's, that's wonderful. Now, let's take it a step farther in the sort of the spiritual realm, as we're looking again at lessons for ourselves today. So much of what we see in, in Genesis and the whole Old Testament, but especially with the story of Joseph, is a shadow of what was coming 2,000 years later through Christ, right? Okay, now for, mo for much of the story, Joseph stands in for the Messiah, for much of it. But once he ends up in charge of Egypt, that shifts a, a fair degree. Now, some, some, I guess you could say he stands in for the Messiah after the Messiah's glorification, and that's fair enough. Uh, but once he's in that position, then you have Joseph standing in basically for the Father, for God the Father. And you've actually got, for example, Judah standing in as the Messiah and sacrificing himself on behalf of his brother Benjamin, right? Or at least attempting to do so. So, he, so then Judah becomes the shadow of Christ. Now, 
if we follow along that, that pattern where Joseph is standing in for God, as far as everybody else in the story is concerned, here we've got Jacob, and don't think about his, his familial relationship with Joseph so much, it's just he's, he's one of God's chosen people, right? And he sends this gift, he gives this gift to Joseph, and, and Joseph gives this gift back to Jacob. One gift is enormously larger than the other, okay? How does that compare to what has happened and what is happening and will happen, I guess? It's all three between us and God. Tim? Well, it's a death that we cannot repay. So his gift to us was so much greater, but our, our gift because of that is salvation. Is, is the point of the gift giving here to one up each other? Yeah. Is the point to pay each other back? Yeah. Yeah. The gifts are given out of love from both sides, aren't they? Now, if neither of them was willing to give the gift, that would tell us something, wouldn't it? It would tell us that they don't have the relationship that they should and maybe claim to have. But the fact that they're willing to do these things for each other shows the love that exists between them, shows that strong relationship. Um, Jacob cannot possibly repay. Jacob cannot possibly earn what Joseph can provide right now. Yet Joseph's willing to give it anyway. That's what we have from the Father. The gift of salvation, the gift of a home in heaven, there's nothing we can do to earn that. Whatever we dedicate to him, whatever worship we give to him, whatever good deeds we do in our lives, as we should. And if we're not willing to, just like if Jacob weren't willing to, it, indica it would indicate a problem on our part. But we can't, we can't earn the gift. It's not a transaction. We can't pay him back for all that he has given, is giving, and will give. So we need to look at it that way, uh, as if we're Jacob and we're giving, we're, we're dedicating things to God. Because we love him. Not because we feel obligated to. Not because we... Um, I that's a bad way to say it. Not because we feel obligated on account of trying to pay back what he's already given. Does that make sense? Getting sort of touchy ground here. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Let's continue reading. Uh, Kevin, do you want to read verses 25 through 28, please? <clears throat> And they left Egypt and returned to their father, Jacob, to the land of Canaan. Joseph is still alive, they told him, and he is governor of all the land of Egypt. Jacob was stunned at the news. He couldn't believe it. But when they repeated to Jacob everything Joseph had told them, and when he saw the wagons Joseph had sent to carry him, their father's spirits revived. Then Jacob explained... It must be true. My son Joseph is alive. I must go and see him before I die. Thank you. Uh, question number four. How did the, the stunned Jacob react to the news that Joseph was alive? Nancy? Well, at first he was numb. He couldn't believe it. Yeah, it was just like, come on. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't put me through this. That's not funny, right? That seems to be his response. Uh, why? why? Why does he react that way? It had been so long, and the last he knew, Joseph, he'd sent Joseph to go check on his brothers, and they came back with his robe that was all bloody. Let's think about that. You said it's been so long. How long did Joseph spend in Jacob's house? Seventeen Four years. time then he's been away. Seventeen years in Jacob's house, twenty-two years out of Jacob's house by then. He's done without his son for a lot longer than he'd ever had his son in the first place. Okay, now once he comes to believe that Joseph is really alive, what was his ambition? To go see him. Sorry? To go see him. Yeah, I just, okay, fine. I know I'm an old man. Uh, I know it's a long way. I have to go see him. Let's keep reading. Sammy, you want to take verses 1 through 4 of chapter 46, please? So Jacob set out for Egypt with all his possessions, and when he came to Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. 
During the night, God spoke to him in a vision. Jacob, Jacob, he called. Here I am, Jacob replied. I am God, the God of your father, the boy said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, and there I will make your family into a great nation. I will go with you down to Egypt, and I will bring you back again. You will die in Egypt, but Joseph will be with you to close your eyes. All right, thank you. Question number five. What did Jacob do at Beersheba on the way to Egypt? He offered sacrifices to God. Offered sacrifices to God. Uh, why does he stop and do it there at Beersheba specifically? That's where he did it the first time when he went when he left to go look for a wife. Okay, so he's so, he's definitely spent time there before. That's at least he where he spent a good portion of his childhood. Right, and he saw the stairway to heaven. That's right. Okay, so this place holds some historical significance to him in his own lifetime. What else? Well, also Abraham and Isaac both had offered. That's right. Okay, so at the, at the same place, Abraham and Isaac had, had uh, I can't remember if they both built altars or if Isaac offered on the altar that Abraham built, but one way or another, uh, there's altars there, or at least one, to the Lord that Jacob's forefathers have built. What else? If you turn and flip on the other page and look at the map, and you kind of follow the track that he has taken here, and you get to Beersheba... What, what does that mark geographically? Halfway along the trip, probably. Yeah, it's kind of... Now, if you remember, as you get later into the history of Israel, so many times when it's trying to describe the entire land of Israel, we'll say, from Dan to Beersheba. Dan is up in the north. It's the northernmost point, basically, of the, the nation of Israel, or the, the land of Israel. Beersheba is the southernmost point. Okay? Once you get past that, you're in the desert on the way to Egypt. You're actually sort of, at least at this time, basically in Egyptian territory. So it's kind of like he's he spent all this time in the, the land where he grew up, and now he's ready to cross that line and go into the unknown, following his faith, following where God has led him. He doesn't know what it's going to be like down there. He's never been down there before. He's heard stories, I'm sure, but he's never been down there as far as we can tell. And he doesn't know what it's going to look like. He doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He doesn't know what's going to happen to his family. He knows that God has promised this land here, this land that I'm leaving to me and to my descendants forever. And I'm going to leave that land and go somewhere else. Okay. So all of that being the case, we've got... Uh, uh, well, what, what, what would be the purposes? Why is he... Making these sacrifices. What is the, the their function? Nancy. Well, he's thankful to God. Okay, so gratitude, oh, sort of a Thanksgiving offering, definitely. That's the first one on my list. What else? He trusts God. Say again. He trusts God. Okay, he so him because he's going ahead with that, he's not. Question here at all. Okay, so uh, I'm trying to think of how to. Like, it's like you're 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 pointing in the same direction that I am, but we need you need to jump a track. <laughs> uh, Janet, your hands. Well, I, I don't know if this looks over, but I mean, he's thankful for finding his son. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, so that goes I back mean, to the, the gratitude yeah. thing. Did I see another hand before Misty? I think went for him. Uh, it just the sacrifices are a way of worship. And in some ways, a way of kind of communicating and prayer and, and yeah. sending those requests up to God, not just his thanks, but his request. You know, I'm going down here. You promised this land. Don't forget us. Okay, so there's two things that you, one of them you sort of passed over quickly. You said worship. Worship. That plays into it. One of them is praise, partly over what God has clearly done, right? He preserved Joseph a lot. The second one is prayer, petition. Okay, so he's offering in thanksgiving for what God has already done, in praise for the, the, the wonderful works that God has done, and in uh, prayer that God will keep his promises and take care of them while they're away. And God responds, well, how does... Uh, missing. There we go. How, how does God respond? He's going to be with them. 
He is going to be with him. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I realized that was it's an excellent answer. It's just not where I wanted to go yet. I was going for intervention. But <laughs> the next question was going to be, what did he say? And yeah, uh, he says, I'm going to be with you. So it's almost as if um, Jacob is, he's kind of, scared is not really the right word, but he's unsure of where he's going. He's never been there before. He's stepping into the unknown. And as he does it, he pauses, and worships God, which is a great example for us to follow, by the way, uh, to worship God, to give thanks to him, and to ask for him to be with him as he goes out into the unknown, into the, this difficult time where he doesn't know what to expect. And God responds to him in this vision and tells him, don't be afraid to go down there, basically. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to keep, your, I'm going to keep the promises that I've given you. I'm going to bring you back up again. Okay, <clears throat> so question number six, who did God say would accompany Jacob to? We just answered that. God said he's going to be with him. Uh, all right, let's move on to, all right, uh, Nancy, we're up to you. Can you read verses 5 through 7, and then Dustin, right after that, we're going to skip verses 8 through 25 with all the names. So can you read verses 26 and 27 right after that? Then Jacob set out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, their little ones, and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his offspring with him. His sons, his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, all of his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came into Egypt were his own descendants, not including Jacob's sons, wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were 70. All right, thank you. Question number seven, and this is from the section that we skipped, but how many children did Leah bear for Jacob and Pot and Aram? Six. Six. Seven. Seven. Six sons and a daughter. Uh, say again, six sons and a daughter, is that what I heard you say? That is correct, but it's not actually what the verse says. Are they what, talking about the grandchildren and everything? Yeah, so the way oh, that it words it, it actually... I was wondering about that. Oh, yeah, okay. it's kind of a confusing question, isn't it? Uh, it's one of those where I looked at it and went, I don't like these questions. Uh, the Verse 15 says 33, but of course it's including uh, the, the grandchildren as well, so all who are Leah's offspring. Okay, so figuratively she has borne these 33 children for Jacob. Uh, seven of those were literally her own children. Uh, by the way... Also in that section that we skipped, we talked some on Sunday and a little bit before that, I think last Wednesday, about not really knowing what Benjamin's age is, but Judah refers to him as the boy. And we had the, the slight suggestion, at least, that maybe Benjamin hadn't been born yet when Joseph went down into Egypt. Now, in this section, um, there's a pretty strong point in favor of the opposite, namely that Benjamin has like 10 sons already. With that said... That doesn't mean it's impossible. Uh, we're, we're talking about people who didn't think polygamy was really a problem. So if he's both quite virile and also has several wives, and even at the age 22 or so, he, eh, it's unlikely. It's unlikely, but it is possible um, that he could have that many children. In any case, question number eight. How many of the house of Jacob came to Egypt? Seven. 70 people. And does this include everyone who was on this trip? No. Sorry? Then he didn't include the wives of Jacob's son. That's right. So this is actually just a count of the direct descendants of Jacob. Um, well, I should back that up. The 66 is a count of the direct descendants of Jacob. The 70 includes... Um, Includes Jacob and presumably his three wives, or alternatively, it includes Jacob and his son Joseph, who's not one of the 66, and Joseph's two sons, uh, uh, 
Manasseh and Ephraim, of course, I'm mixing up the Judas, right? Manasseh and Ephraim, that would also total up to 70. And it's not exactly clear which one he's going. I tend to think it's the latter because he's talking about specifically Jacob's offspring and his wives are not his offspring. So that's, that's probably where he's going. All right, we've got a couple minutes left here. Uh, yes? Uh, we're still answering the question. Uh, yeah. So at some point, I wanted to go back to verse 24 when we get a chance. Okay, um, I think this would be the right time to do it. That yeah, where, where Joseph told his brothers not to quarrel on the journey. Oh, oh okay, yeah. I think we kind of passed that, didn't we? Yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're almost a chapter past it now, but that's fine. So, you just have a point to make from it? Right, that because of all the, what they had done in the past and all, it's like, and what happened here, get along on the way back, don't fight over the fact that I'm alive and what happened, and almost like what we talked about to start, the lesson why that never came up is because he tells them well, basically just forget about it. Yeah, maybe that's point. why we never hear about it anymore. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it in, in exactly that context that that has a direct bearing on the conversation about all that transpired 22 years ago. But that's probably right, Nancy. And here's another thing you know, they had to explain to him how come Joseph was alive, right? Yeah, well, they had to have exactly that's, that's what that's what Tim was getting at, and I talked about it briefly earlier as well. And, we're just not told. We don't know exactly what that conversation looked like. Uh, I I guess we can assume that the brothers came clean based on what we find out uh, later in chapter 50, I think it is. Um, yeah, I'm going to spend all the rest of the, of the time trying to find it if I do that. Um, we do see some indications that Joseph, or that Jacob rather, is aware by the end of his life at least that the brothers had sold him into slavery and, and all that all that nonsense. So uh, presumably this is when he found out, but the text just doesn't focus on it. It's choosing, it's choosing to focus on other things instead. All right. We have a little bit more to read. We're not going to completely finish out the chapter, but uh, Scott, would you like to read verses 28 through 30, please? Now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father, Israel. <coughs> as soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, Now I am ready to die, since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. All right, thank you. So that kind of rounds out the, the narrative for us, and it's a very um, tidy conclusion to the whole thing. Uh, we do have... Now I see there's a question that I missed. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have time to cover it. Question number nine. Uh, how did the Egyptians feel toward shepherds? They were abomination. Yeah, they considered them to be a, an abomination, and that has some ramifications uh, with the, the whole enslavement thing later on, but uh, we don't have time to get into that right now. So let's spend the last minute or two that we have on question number three under thinking about the lesson. How do you view forgiveness and the consequences of sin? Uh, I'll take a stab. Um, I, you can forgive the sin, but consequences, if any, are already set in motion. Okay, yeah, so there are... Yeah, you, some, sometimes when you are the one in the position to forgive, you can also mitigate or even remove some of the consequences of that person's sin. But oftentimes, there's no way to do that. Denise? Uh, that's, okay. that's what I was going to say, that there's, there's always consequences to everything that you do, it, whether good or bad. So even though you have asked for forgiveness, you've been forgiven, God has forgiven you, those consequences never go away. It doesn't mean that they're not going to follow you. That's right. right. And, and sometimes... Um, that's hard for us to deal with. There's, there's tension between the idea of I will remember your sins no more and also here I am living with the results of my foolish transgressions. How can these two be the case at the same time? And it's because God is spirit and we are flesh. Here we are living in this physical world which has built into it cause and effect. And if I do something foolish, or if I do something evil, let's just put it that way, then there's probably going to be a, 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 a result from that in the physical world that follows directly from what I have done. 
even if I'm square with God, even if I've repented, even if God has forgiven me. And we look forward to a time when that's no longer the case and when the consequences can actually be wiped out as well. But that's not going to happen until the flesh is abolished. Um, so one other thing that I wanted to say about that. What was it? Okay, so I'm not going to remember it. All that being the case, we can see the way that, that Joseph... For, oh, that's what it was. It was about consequences. It was about consequences. You said there are going to be consequences for everything that we do, good or bad. Okay? Sometimes the consequences for the good things that we do seem to us to be very bad. Right? We have the expression, no good deed ever goes unpunished. Also, sometimes the consequences for bad things that we have done end up for the good, because that's how God was using it. Like when you sell your brother into slavery, and that ends up saving your whole family. Okay, so we need to make sure we're not taking the, the physical results as vindication of whatever we have done, because that might not be the case. Let's focus ourselves on obeying the Lord and pleasing Him and everything and looking at the throne of the Lord. All right, thank you. We'll be on lesson 63 from Sunday. Okay, Ezra, can you quiet down? And I can All right. And then not for Thank you for showing that Everybody here at midweek, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Fletcher will be uh, giving us the invitation in just a moment. Um, go ahead and mark uh, 620. If you're going to be using one of the songbooks, that will be the song of invitation after a uh, brief word from Fletcher. Uh, before that, though, we will sing 531, Faith of Our Fathers. 531. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of Thank you. 
So I want to start off with a simple question. Who is God? Um, First, God is our creator. Um, He made the world, the universe, and us. Um, Genesis 1-1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And Psalm 139-13 states, For you informed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Second, God is all-powerful. I've had to remind myself this uh, many times throughout the day um, for the past couple of weeks. Through God's power, the Red Sea was divided, and he saved the Israelites from the Egyptians. So uh, let's read Exodus chapter 14, um, 15 through 31. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground, and I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the hosts of Egypt and the hosts of Israel. And there was a cloud in the darkness, and it lit up in the night, without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night. And made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went to the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them, into the midst of the sea, and all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watched the Lord in the pillar of fire, and have cloud looked down the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, and the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course, when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, all of the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the people of Israel walked on dry land through the sea, <clears throat> the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. By God's power, too, Jesus was raised from the grave. Acts three fourteen and 15 says, But you denied the Holy and Righteous One, and asked for, for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. So God is our creator, and he is all-powerful. Um, third, God is all-knowing. He has infinite wisdom, understanding, and insight. Um, he knows everything, and we don't. We need to, so because of that, we need to humble ourselves before him. Um, Hebrews 4.13, it says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him, to whom we must give it account. With God being all-knowing, he also knows when Jesus is going to come back, as stated in Matthew 24, 36. He is the only one that knows when that day and hour will be. And fourth, God is everywhere. Um, Psalm 139, it says in 7 and 8, Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. God is present in all places, all the time. And Proverbs 15.3 also tells us that the eyes of God are everywhere. Fifth, God is love. 
Um, if you go to 1 John chapter 4, 9 through 10. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son to the world, so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So to conclude, God is many things. He is the source of our strength when life gets tough. As Psalm 46 once says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God is the giver of eternal life through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, as can, as can be seen in John 14, 6. And according to Isaiah 12, 2, God is our salvation. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. So, as you can see, God is the best at all things. He loves us and provided us with a way to join him in heaven through the death and rising of Jesus. So we need to follow him. If you're not a Christian, why not? Don't you want to be associated with the best and have the hope of heaven? If you are a Christian but have fallen away, then you need to make things right with him. If there's anything we can do for you, please come as we stand and sing. to uh, Fletcher uh, for his thoughts in the invitation tonight, uh, and to Jeremy and the other uh, teachers for the classes they put on uh, this evening as well. Uh, I have a lot of things I'm aware of to make mention tonight, and I'm sure uh, several others on top of that. We do want to uh, remember uh, Northwest, who's in the midst of their gospel meeting this week. 
Uh, they'll be meeting uh, Thursday and Friday. If you haven't had an opportunity out, I'm hoping to be there tomorrow if the whole plan holds up. So hopefully see some of you there. Um, <clears throat> we do also uh, want to remember uh, Dave, who's away from us and working this evening. Um, I talked to uh, Sandy a little bit this week. She uh, um, sent her uh, regards to everybody, talked about a uh, uh, procedure Bob's having, but sounded like things are... Uh, going well overall, um, expressed her wishes to be back here in person with us, but it didn't sound like that was going to actually be uh, possible in her estimation anytime soon, so we want to continue to remember her, uh, and of course uh, Charlotte as well. Um, uh, I don't have any new information necessarily, uh, Jacob, about the situation with, uh, with your wife that Jeremy had detailed Monday, but... Um, if there's anything more to say there, just something that we want to continue to pray over and uh, and be uh, mindful of. It's a, it's a pretty scary thing to deal with, especially uh, from a distance. Um, let's also remember uh, Devin Dasher, of course, at, uh, the whole uh, cancer situation as it plays out. Let's uh, continue to be praying uh, for Devin and also the rest of the family. There's a lot to, a lot to be done and a lot of uh, a lot of burden to be bared there. Um, <clears throat> A couple other things I am aware of, as Jeremy mentioned, in the shop in the yard Monday, um, we do have dates for the spring gospel meeting. Um, and that is with, uh, of course, uh, Mallory's uh, father. Um, and kind of the backstory there, for those who may not know, uh, Brooks retired a little over a year ago. Uh, one of his goals when he got into retirement was that he wanted um, to, uh, to, to uh, do more work in the church in general, gospel meetings in particular. Uh, so he's not a pulpit preacher officially, um, but we are looking forward to uh, having Brooks out here um, for that meeting in the spring. Many of you, of course, have met him uh, and know him to some degree, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, also, um, we've got a, a small sign-up sheet posted uh, on the bulletin board tonight. Um, Jeremy is going to be uh, in uh, Rantoul um, later this month, uh, Thanksgiving week. He's got to give a, a, a report and update to them. Um, since uh, they do uh, some of his uh, financial support. So he will be out uh, the 24th and the 28th. So we have uh, some classes and some preaching spots open uh, for the men who are going to be in town. Um, we would uh, encourage you to uh, take a look at that, sign up for that, um, give it some thought. Um, <clears throat> Chris was uh, supposed to be doing a closing prayer. He's not uh, with us. So I'm going to ask uh, if Brian can lead us in that in a minute. Um, before Brian leads us in that prayer, is there anything else? Uh, that we need to make mention of yet this evening. Don't see any takers. Uh, so then uh, Ryan will dismiss us in that closing word of prayer. Let's pray. Our holy and merciful Father who Heart in heaven, we're thankful for this day and the time that we've had to to assemble here and to study from your word. We pray, Father, that the study has been profitable and there are things that we can learn from the study. And we pray that, most importantly, that we will take what we've learned and apply it to our lives in such a way that we can be better servants unto you and to represent you and your word in a more clear and precise manner. We're also mindful, Father, of those who are not with us because of sickness. We may be dealing with health issues, and we humbly pray that you would continue to be with Dave Diggerson. Pray that you would also be with Sandy. And we also pray that you be with the families who might be dealing with uncertainty, especially with the Dustin family. We pray that things will go well with his brother and and they might be able to find a means by which he can recover from whatever uh, is ill in him at this time. We are so thankful, Father, for your Son who has given us hope, hope of salvation, and that of forgiveness of sins. And we know that we're not perfect, and we're trying to live the best that we can. And we pray, Father, that we will always look to your word, that it will be a light to our path. But help us, Father, to to walk in it, to do those things that will be pleasing before you. We humbly ask that you would forgive us of anything that we may have said or done, and as we leave this place, we might be uh, holy and, and ready to serve you in the coming days and weeks and months. 
And these things we humbly pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.